Welcome to St. Macker's Romfali Church. Welcome to our Good Friday service. We gather to reflect on the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. In Psalm 16, it says this, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. In that trust, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Mysterious God, eternal and wise, we come to you confused and uncertain on this Good Friday. We stand at the foot of the cross, the cross where Jesus, your son, died a lonely, painful death a death that reveals the depth of your love for us. We come today to remember, to remember that your love overcomes death, that your love is greater than our hate, and that your love can restore all things. Forgive us, O oh God, for those times when we forsake you, when we leave you dying on the cross and turn away from you. Forgive us, O oh God, for those times when we ignore the suffering all around us and choose instead the way of selfish indulgence. God of grace and mercy, forgive us and renew us. Give us strength and curry, courage to carry our cross each day and to put self behind and others first. May we die to self that you might live through us. In the name of the true King of the world, we pray as he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. We will continue to read from Matthew's Gospel and today this, the passages are taken from chapter 27. And we begin or pick up the story um, from verse 11. So Matthew 27, verse 11 to 32. Jesus has been in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, and has now been taken to the Roman governor, Pilate, who alone has the authority to allow executions. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you. But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. When Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. 
that the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered a whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Wash your hands. It is strange over the last few weeks when I've been rereading these so well known chapters, these passages about Jesus' arrest, his trials, and his suffering. When I read them, totally different things jump out at me than normally would do so. It is because the world around us has so suddenly changed. Our COVID-19 world has changed our perspective. And suddenly what we didn't see before now just jumps out at us. Last week as we visualized the crowds in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, perhaps we felt a little uncomfortable at the thought of big crowds, throngs of people gathered to welcome Jesus. Now, crowds are dangerous. Last night, we couldn't share the Lord's Supper as we normally do on Monday, Thursday, when we gather in the hall below the sanctuary and sit in the round to pass the bread and the wine between us. Suddenly, we see the potential for contamination everywhere. And in our reading that we've just read, what jumped out at me was Pilate washing his hands. We are all told to wash our hands as often as we can. And here we have Pilate washing his hands publicly in front of the crowd to make quite clear that he was washing his hands uh, of the guilt of the responsibility for the situation. He wanted to make quite clear that this was on their heads, the heads of the people, the crowds that called for Jesus' death. We've been told to wash our hands to protect ourselves from getting the coronavirus. It has been impossible to buy antibacterial hand gel uh, and even normal soap has been in short supply. Of course, washing our hands has turned out not to be enough to protect us. Thousands of people have got ill and by now also thousands have lost their lives. 
Pilate's washing his hands. He's doing that as a PR exercise. Of course, he was guilty of condemning an innocent man to death. His wife's dream, a last warning to make clear that really Jesus was innocent and he knew it. But Pilate had a part to play and he made his choices. Matthew, the writer of this gospel, makes quite clear in how he constructs it and in how he tells the story that all are guilty. Judas was responsible and guilty of betraying Jesus, his friend. The chief priests and the elders who had skewed their midnight Sanhedrin trial, they were guilty. Pilate, the governor, and the crowds who had gathered in front of him and asked for Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified, they were guilty. And then the soldiers who get carried away in their cruel games, they were guilty. They are all guilty. All of humanity is represented here. They all take part in this awful drama and all are guilty of condemning an innocent man to death. What about us? Can we wash our hands of this drama? Ultimately, it is the virus of sin that affects us all that has brought Jesus to the cross. Our individual and collective failures to live life as God intended it. Our rejection of his calling for each of us to be his image bearers, to be light bearers in this world. We all share in this. We have all turned away from God and still in lots of small and large ways do this even today. Only Jesus fulfilled and completed this human calling perfectly. Jesus was the one who truly was in the image of God and he was the true light bearer in this dark world. We cannot wash our hands of Jesus' suffering and death, but we can wash ourselves in the blood of Christ and so receive forgiveness. It is perhaps a strange concept to us, but in the Jewish temple worship, the blood of sacrificial animals was used and sprinkled on people and objects as a way of cleansing and setting aside these people or these objects for holy service. Blood was seen as a cleanser. Jesus' talk at the Last Supper about the blood of the new covenant is a sign that his death would bring forgiveness and cleansing. Washing our hands of Jesus will not clear our consciences, but Jesus' blood shed on the cross in a mysterious way does deal with the deadliest virus there is. The deadliest virus is the sin that separates us from God and leads to eternal separation from him. Jesus' death on the cross has the power to wipe out this virus, make us immune to it, and bring us new life.
read from Matthew 27, verses 33 to 44. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants to. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema samachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. 
The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. One of the most harrowing things about the present crisis is the thought that so many people are dying alone. Most hospitals have now banned visiting, with the exemption of those receiving end-of-life care, being allowed to perhaps one person to attend. However, if someone is in the hospital with COVID-19, the rest of the family have to self-isolate so they can't come in to be with this person. It is such a horrible thought that troubles us all. Even though there were crowds around the cross and two brigands either side of Jesus, he does appear desperately alone. Everyone has turned against him. Matthew does not mention a repentant fellow sufferer as Luke does. Matthew does not have Mary, his mother, standing at the foot of the cross as John has. Matthew only says in verse 55 that many women were there, but they were looking on from afar. Jesus seems all alone, abandoned in darkness and agony. The cry that rings out from his lips is deeply troubling. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a quote from Psalm 22, and with that single line, a world of misery is brought to mind. A world where everyone has turned against you, you are desperately trying to hang on to faith struggling to cling on to God. Gone is the familiar, my father. Jesus cries, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the struggle, even in this final struggle, the only one to turn to is God. The writer of Psalm 22 says this, be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. It is deeply disturbing to think that we or someone we love might die alone. And we pray to God for mercy that this will not happen. But even if it does, we have this. That even in the darkest and most lonely hours, Jesus does not abandon us. Leith Fisher wrote this. Jesus, in his humanity, knows this experience of godlessness. And it is with that knowledge he remains Emmanuel, God with us. In our most dire moments of God-forsakenness and abandonment. So now there is no place, no isolation so absolute, or Christ will be there. Emmanuel, God with us, will not abandon or forsake us. Even in death, we are not alone. We are going to watch and listen to a video by the Psalm Project, and it is based on Psalm 22. Why have you left? 
to read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 51 to 61. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women who were there, watching from a distance, they had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And we give thanks to God for these readings from his holy word. I want to read to you a reflection called Things Are Different Now, which was written by Reverend Dr. Leslie Stewart. I wish I knew then what I know now, how precious time was as he walked among us. There were crowds and questions, the excitement of hearing and seeing, and some so blessed to know his touch. How quickly things can change, all in the blink of an eye. From cheers to jeers, from faith to fear, from celebrations to mourning. 
I wish I knew then what I know now, how precious all time is, as still he dwells among us. No crowds now, but questions remain. No chance to gather and hear and see in ways we have always known. Things are different now. The days are long, the nights are dark. Now testing times are here. Fears still need their release. Hands still long to be held. And in private mourning, death is keenly felt. Things are different now. With those who once waited, we must wait, trusting in the life which will rise again. For we will declare, now as before, that he is risen, he is risen indeed. pray to God. God our Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the life and for the death of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for his faithfulness to his calling, the human calling that was for all of us and which we failed to fulfill. The calling to be image bearers of you, light bearers in the world. We wanted to wash our hands clean of sin, but it has infected us all. Lord, have mercy and wash us clean in the blood of Christ. May our rebellious hearts be overcome by the love displayed in Christ. May we be born to new life through his death on the cross. Cleanse us and set us aside for service. In your mercy, Lord. Loving God, help us today to hear the prayers of the forsaken ones. Let their cries not fall on deaf ears, but let them rise to you and return to us for action. For all who are facing death, draw near and let them draw comfort from your presence and journey with them into the next life. For all
all who are suffering from pain or threats of violence, help us not to become deaf to their cries, but instead to find ways to stand alongside them or speak out for them. For all who are feeling as though you have left them, may they hear the words of Jesus on the cross and be comforted to know that you never leave us. For all who feel unloved, uncared for, who have been neglected or abused, may they know that you love them and that you long to care for them. Lord Jesus, your greatest gift to us was to live the way of love no matter what, even when it led to a horrible, painful death, that we might see how much God loves us. May we understand that you call us to die to our selfish wants and desires so that we might care for others. And at this time, we remember especially those who are setting aside their own safety in order to care for those who need it. O oh God, direct us in your way. May we try to follow you and be faithful to our calling. Walk with us and never forsake us as we carry our cross and reveal your kingdom here on earth, today and always. Amen. We end our worship and leave this place at the foot of the cross in the knowledge that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, even in isolation and in times of fear. May his grace sustain you, his blessing cover you, and his life bring you new life. Amen.